Welcome, everyone. I'm Carol Zaleski, and I have the honor of introducing Amy Hubbard. Um, as many of you know, the Jill Kirk Conway Chair, uh, we have Jill Kirk Conway with us here. It's just such a great honor. Um, uh, this chair is the gift of an anonymous donor, a practitioner of the Bodhisattva virtue of perfection of giving, who also gave us the um, <laughs> there tea we house. Go where you can see an abstract rendering of the stages of the Buddha's progress for enlightenment. Today our enlightenment comes from Jamie Hubbard, um, formerly the Numata shareholder. Uh, still. And still the Numata <laughs> 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 Wow, yes. One. These two chairs, <laughs> which owe so much to Tai Tetsu Uno, created the foundation for a program in Buddhist studies for which Smith College has achieved international renown. We're really on the map in Buddhist studies. This is a major center. Um, Ty would be very happy to see Jamie as the Conway chair in addition to the Nomada chair. And our only sad note today is that Ty is no longer with us, having passed away in December. Um, yeah. Jamie, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce Jamie in terms of two characteristics. You might call it gravitas and grace or happiness. Okay, let's start with the gravitas. <laughs> Jamie is a scholar of Buddhism in medieval China and of Buddhist Shinto and Confucian elements in the making of modern Japan. So he's medieval and modern, and that in many different senses. Uh, his mastery of both medieval and modern Chinese and Japanese languages, his sensitivity, uh, to medieval and modern phenomena, to popular and elite phenomena, his grasp of Buddhism on the ground, as witnessed his BBC documentary, The Yamaguchi Story, um, on Buddhism and the family in contemporary Japan, um, and his grasp of Buddhism in cyberspace. <laughs> well back, uh, those of you who were around may remember this, there was a controversy about whether Zen counts as authentic Buddhism. And this is the subject of a book that uh, Jamie put together called Pruning the Bodhi Tree. It was the fruit of symposia that he organized here at Smith, um, having to do with the critical Buddhism movement in post-war Japan. Critical Buddhism <coughs> claimed that Zen had wedded mysticism to empire, thus contributing to the disaster of involvement in the Second World War. Uh, this whole uh, critical movement provoked a storm which really called for some level-headed inquiry and searching examination of the nature of Buddhist studies, indeed of religion and modernity in Japan. And Jamie was a voice of reason in, during this very heated time. Does that ring a bell? I'm, uh, the the story rings a bell. The voice of reason I'm not so sure about. <laughs> of, of leadership <laughs> and grace. Um, moderating the different voices in this, in this discussion. Um, and, is, and is widely, universally respected for that role. At the same time, Jamie was continuing his work in medieval Chinese and Japanese Buddhist history. He was investigating um, a host of manuscripts uh, discovered in the Dunhuang Caves along the Silk Road. I think Dead Sea Scrolls. This is that important, the contents of these caves, right? And uh, in, these, uh, in the manuscripts from the Dunhuang Caves, Jamie uncovered the story of a little known, um, yet in its day, very influential medieval social welfare organization that was connected to a non-mainstream uh, Chinese Buddhist sect, and published a book on that called Absolute Delusion, Perfect Buddhahood, the Rise and Fall of a Chinese Heresy. And he also made manuscript sources connected with this and with other uh, related topics available online. And with this and, and other projects, he's done pioneering work in the digital humanities, and in so doing has attracted a great deal of web traffic to Smith College and uh, to uh, reinforcing our reputation as a leader uh, and a center for scholarship on Buddhism. Jamie's most recent publication, I believe, um, it's a translation of a commentary on the Vimala Kirti Sutra, a sutra that those of us who've taught in the intro to Roman Buddhist class think of with great fondness, um, a very important Buddhist text. Um, this commentary by Prince Shotoku, the regent, um, seventh century regent, 
who forged the identity of imperial Buddhism in Japan. It's an absolutely key text. So it's a great service to have it available in a language accessible to American and European scholars who can't, those who can't read it in the original. Jamie is now the longest, is that true? <laughs> Depends on what comes after this. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, which one of you came first? Oh, Tom, Tom came before I did, but I, but in the current, in the current faculty. That's why I wrote that. I was thinking, wait a minute, this is not true at all. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, the Interesting. Member, who is not emeritus, like Tom, Carl, Tom, Reed, and, and other lamented members that we all remember with great fondness. He's also the first person in the department that I met. Remember that day? I, I, it's I remember part of my, day. I got that written it down. That first signal, this would be a really warm and welcoming department. And a little bit wacky. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Um, you know, I think if this were Japan, there would be some category of cultural treasures we'd be able to place you in. Right? <laughs> Isn't it? There are lots of classifications of you know, living cultural treasures. Um, yeah, uh, and, in one, and in this sense, among others, that he has done so much to enrich our, our common life, our intellectual community, um, and, and to provide entertainment as well by bringing a never-ending stream of Buddhist scholars, practitioners, artists, performers to this campus, um, including the ongoing series right now, Cyborg Buddha and the Technologies of Awareness, uh, for which this uh, talk has a, has a connection. Jamie labored uh, with his colleagues in Buddhist studies, both within religion and outside of religion, uh, to bring to birth the five college uh, Buddhist studies certificate and also the concentration in Buddhist studies. And he continues to nurture these programs, as well as serving with his wife, Maki, uh, the associated Kyoto program and related efforts. Um, Maki Hubbard, uh, professor of Japanese. That gives you a sense of, of the gravitas part of what I wanted to say. But I also want to say a little bit quickly about Jamie's lightness, his lightness of being. Uh, he knows how to have fun. <coughs> He's laid back, a little bohemian, warm, friendly, um, very good for the soul of our department. We all have to have <laughs> in everything and everybody, exuberant, um, little touch of the cynical, always very, uh, but always in a positive, positive sense. Um, when his time came to serve as department chair, he perfected another of the bodhisattva virtues, the virtue of canceling a meeting when you don't really need to have one. <laughs> <laughs> He's a friend to all of us and a gifted collaborator, witnessed his work with Phil Peake on Buddhism and happiness. And on that happy note, I give you Jamie Hope. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, nobody's ever accused me of being too softly spoken, so I as assume you can all hear me, otherwise I have to kind of make it over to the mic, which will be complicated. Um, thank you for that uh, a warm uh, introduction. I, I too fondly remember when I first met Carol, and it was interesting because it was um, not here at Smith College, but it was actually in the living room of Bob Thurman, uh, the doyen of Tibetan Buddhist studies, who at the time was teaching over at Amherst College. And I thought that it was wonderful to have s that kind of a uh, s colleague whose intellectual range went far beyond what you might ever expect. And my colleagues in the religion department, uh, the Buddhist studies concentration, East Asian studies here at Smith College, uh, and the rest of the Smith College have never let me down in that regard. Um, though I myself, myself might have remained a little bit more parochial in my uh, range. Um, Carol will get the pun on the parochial side of things. Um, and yeah, I can't leave out my colleagues, uh, my other esteemed colleagues in East Asian languages and literatures, uh, of whom my wife is one. And uh, it was actually she was the one who got the job here that brought me to, um, from the Midwest to this wonderful institution. Um, it's, a very, it's a great honor and a treat for me to give this talk uh, in recognition of being appointed to the Jill Kerr Conway Chair in Religion and East Asian Studies. President Conway did so very much 
for East Asian studies during her time as president, including the construction of the Japanese garden and tea hut that uh, Carol just mentioned, supporting curricular and faculty development, and much, much more. So it's always been a little bit odd um, that I never have actually met President Conway. <laughs> um, and uh, in spite of many near crosses of our paths, as she would return to campus for one thing or another, and you know, you know, I would be sort of nearby, but maybe passing in the night of a cocktail evening. Um, but on the other hand, it's perhaps not so odd since my first year at Smith College, 1985, was also the first year of President Conway's retirement from her presidency here uh, at Smith College. So it was pr with particular excitement and pride that um, I was able to, to I, I reached out uh, and just kind of sent an, an odd email and said, ah, you know, by the way, I, yeah, I know it's been six months since this actually happened, but I was appointed to the Jill Kerr Conway chair and I wanted to say, hi, this is a little bit about who I am and, um, and I have to give this talk. Um, and so if you have any interest at all in coming out to the talk, it would be a wonderful thing. And it is a wonderful thing, and I'm very excited that we're able to welcome President Conway back to Smith College. It's, it's an honor. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> On my screen, my personal Google Calendar has just surfaced. You better make <laughs> that go away. Um, so um, I have a mountain of stuff here to talk about, and uh, it will go on for long enough so that I will be able to preclude any questions that you might have out there. Um, but for a number of years now, and, this, and so this talk is also about something that I don't really know anything about in many, many ways. It's quite far from my normal fields of endeavor, which, as Carol said, are East Asian Buddhism and particularly sort of arcane uh, philological studies of texts and comparisons of different recensions and all of that kind of sort of stuff. Um, but for a number of years I've been team teaching a class on happiness with Professor Phil Peak, who's sitting back there. Uh, and then it's a course in which we look at the flood of Buddhism and literature, uh, psychology, neuroscience, and the like. We also collect some of the wearables, you know, these little EEG things you can have and these other kind of devices that promise to, uh, to give you more instant ways to, uh, to happiness and Buddhist awareness, but that's a bit of a different story. We have some of them if you'd like to try them later. Um, at the same time, I've long taught a seminar here at Smith on uh, classical descriptions of Buddhist awakening, uh, enlightenment. Um, and so this talk is kind of a, a collection of my rumin rumini ruminifications. Does science bear out this fundamental Buddhist truth? Is life really, truly, and always miserable until awakening? And even if we don't want to go whole hog and proclaim universal and pervasive suffering, we can still ask the happiness gurus, how much happier do I want or need to be? And even if I would like to be happier, is the work required to get there worth it? <laughs> and, and which of the many varied Buddhist technologies uh, would be doing the best part for that? Finally, I'm also extremely interested in the increasing sophistication of the uh, neurobiological and other studies of virtuoso Buddhists and other really, really happy folks. The findings that are being presented about their brains and what this might uh, mean for us and our pursuit of Buddha brain, Buddha's brain. In other words, just as eyeglasses or prosthetic limb uh, or clothing on a cold day like today, right, <laughs> uh, might enhance our physical self, will the neurobiological, uh, pharmaceutical, hello, uh, and other emerging technologies similarly enhance our state of awareness, our Buddha nature. The Dalai Lama has been reported to say <laughs> he's been reported to say a lot of stuff, um, that if there really were an enlightenment pill that could, in fact, exactly achieve the goal of Buddhist awakening, he would take it immediately and fund companies to mass produce it. <laughs> um, he also said, and this is kind of a fun new thing that I just discovered, um, I mean, I knew about the saying before, but I didn't know about, uh, I didn't know about wireheading. Anybody familiar with wi wireheading out there? Yeah, George, of course, George is. Um, <coughs> in 
in, um, in, November 19, uh, in November 2005, at the very famous um, Society for Neuroscience Congress, the one that in which his uh, uh, presenting of the keynote address was very widely protested, but mostly by, well, by the scientific community. I mean, what's a monk addressing a neuroscience thing? But there was a whole lot of Chinese scientists <laughs> being prominent among the, uh, the, um, the dissenters. And he told them in his uh, plenary address, quote, if it was possible to become free of negative emotions by a riskless implementation of an electrode without impairing intelligence and the critical mind, I would be the first patient. Will this come true someday? You know? And, um, you know, like I said, uh, wireheading, go out there, uh, go out there and Google wireheading sometime. It's a, it's a pretty out there um, part of the underground consciousness hacking world. Um, so to make a long story short, I'm very interested in um, the possibility that in the not too distant future, we might reverse the now kind of standard view that if, if you change the way you think, uh, your consciousness, your awareness, um, then you can also have an effect on the hardwiring as well. In other words, change the way you think and uh, change your brain, right? Some people call this uh, neuroplasticity. I think that that's a little bit uh, uh, hyper-used and somewhat misused uh, term these days. Um, but you wonder, I wonder if you're maybe going to be able to go the other way, change your mind and change your brain. In other words, if, if I plant an electrode in there that eliminates the uh, nasty effects of my amygdala, um, will that actually have a change on my overall consciousness and awareness? Will I become a kinder human being because of that? Or will it remain a neurophysiological kind of intervention? Um, so uh, a caveat or five um, before I begin. As I said, first of all, this is ridiculously long uh, presentation. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about Buddhism. Uh, or the Buddhist tradition, or even more simply, Buddha. And similarly, I'm going to lump all of the positive psychologists and their ideas into a group called the happiness industry. And the neuroscientists, I'm just simply going to call the neuroscientists, although my colleague, Phil, over there, um, the psychology professor, has warned me in looking through my paper that I use the word neuroscientists much too often that I should stick to a little bit better science, but that's, a, that's another story. Um, and sometimes I'm going to sm smush all that stuff together as just Western science. Um, and I entirely realize that this is a great crime to everybody involved, uh, but such is the, the constraints of, uh, of time. Um, another caveat is that I expect to be misunderstood. I am not saying that meditation is not good for you or not all that it's cracked up to be. I love to sit in the practice of contemplative technologies. And I've been doing it for more than 40 years, uh, from you know, name-dropping monasteries to name-dropping monasteries you know, up in the Himalayas with the Dalai Lama or with you know, blah, blah, Roshi in Kyoto or in uh, Sri Lanka or Thailand. Or more, most recently, I've been having a whole lot of fun in, uh, in Burma. Uh, which, as some of you know, we had a long conference or a series of speakers last semester that came as a result of that. Um, and I'm especially in, in, enjoy um, sitting down um, on my cushion here in the valley, uh, as I said, up in Berry Mass at Insight Meditation Society or the uh, Berry Center for Buddhist Studies. And even, oddly, <laughs> many years ago, uh, I led the Smith College Meditation Group uh, when one or the other of the Buddhist teachers were absent. So I like this stuff, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and I'm certainly not saying that these technologies of awareness are not warranted. And I'm certainly also not saying that suffering does not exist in the world. Um, these caveats will become more clear to you when I unpack my cynical <laughs> uh, af affirmations. The, 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 the other title for this talk 
is actually um, heretical affirmations of a neurobiological Ichantaka. <laughs> and Ichantaka is a being in the Buddhist world that is forever precluded uh, awakening. They're like excommunicated. They can't become enlightened. So, um, but they're, so to, to make that claim is heretical on, on the one hand, but to me it's, it's a source of, of great affirmation of some other stuff, okay? So that's where I want to go. Uh, and one final caveat, yeah, the subtitle of this talk is, or what I learned from Dr. Phil. Now, <laughs> rest assured, I'm not going to reveal everything that I've learned from Dr. Phil. But I have benefited greatly from his tutelage in manners, um, uh, psychological and otherwise. So for all of that, um, I'm speaking from the vantage point of a Buddhist scholar, certainly not an expert in the mind or the biology of the mind. So for that reason, all of the mistakes that I make with regard to that are all Phil's fault. Okay? <laughs> um, so, the first question, does happiness equal nirvana? And the, uh, the very simple answer to that is no. <laughs> the field of positive psychology comes from an attempt to see psychology not just as a source of remedying uh, mental illness, that kind of classical Freudian notion that um, what, what analysis does is helps people transform their neurotic and hysterical misery into ordinary banal human unhappiness. <laughs> right? And so the field of positive psychology comes from a rather different place uh, where they want to study truly happy and flourishing folks in order to understand what that looks like. Right? What's, the, what's the psychology? What's the, the science uh, of, of, of the flourishing people? Why should we only study the minds of the sick folks? I mean, there's lots of good reasons to help people who have illnesses, but why not also look at the, uh, at the flourishing kinds of folks? Um, and so they study these truly happen, happy and flourishing folks in order to understand what they are about. And for them, happiness means not just happy, uh, but happier, flourishing. The perception that life is fulfilling, meaningful, pleasant, satisfying, in control, all is well, a positive affect, excitement, interested in things, uh, proud of accomplishments, low degree of self-focus, but high degree of self-esteem and self-satisfaction. Flourishing <coughs> is also sometimes taken to include the idea of flow. Uh, Chick sent me high, you know, he did all the study. A state of concentration in, uh, or, or involvement with the task and the circumstances in which there's sort of a loss of self-awareness in the activity of the here and now. Um, nirvana, on the other hand, uh, does, or for, for the Buddhists, happiness was typically not the point. Rather, the point was getting out, uh, eliminating the endless rounds of birth in samsara, birth in the world, and the suffering and dissatisfaction and frustration that is inevitably associated with that birth. The elimination of suffering is coterminous with nirvana or satori or awakening or bodhi. Um, the only word that the Buddhists don't use to describe this state is enlightenment. <laughs> There's no word that I know of in any Buddhist language that uses a light metaphor. It's interesting that we've fixed on that. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's whatever you want to call it, it's a state that's defined in widely different ways throughout the Buddhist tradition, but not so very often in terms of happiness. So in the negative spirit of Buddhist descriptions of the goal, let me give you a few ideas of what Buddhist nirvana is not. Nirvana is not a denial of learning, regression, childlike innocence, or the uninhibited emotional expression of such innocence. It's not a state of uh, trance state of union, oneness, an altered state of consciousness, permanent bliss, a state of in the moment ecstasy or flow. N this is not to say that Buddhists did not develop a variety of contemplative technologies that do inculcate those states of trance and sort of feelings of oneness and bliss, um, but that was never understood to be the goal. That was something that was kind of perhaps enjoyable, but in fact, in much of the Buddhist tradition, and it's a very interesting discussion going on up now in Barrie about this whole, this whole business, um, they were considered oftentimes to be distractions. You know, these blissful entries into trance states of altered consciousness were considered uh, taking you away from the path of awakening. 
Um, it's also Buddhist awakening is not subjugation, uh, surrender to a higher power. It's not beyond the self, which is kind of an interesting one because uh, Buddhists don't believe in a self, so you can't really go beyond one, right? <laughs> um, it doesn't exist in the first place. So it's not beyond the self, it's not transcendence of this world, um, a disavowal, and it's certainly not a disavowal of our normal everyday self. It's also not beyond conceptual thought, some kind of non-discriminating wisdom or unconstructed consciousness. <coughs> Nirvana is typically described as the elimination of all cognitive and or emotional hindrances to nirvana, typically and classically uh, greed, hatred, and ignorance, through insight into the impermanent nature of all things, which frees us from our attraction and aversion, and it, uh, by definition, frees us also from our delusion. Um, and as a bonus, and this is a very important, important bonus that I'll come back to, it also includes the elimination of any further birth in this world. Uh, samsara is the world for this, uh, the, for our, the world in which we live. Samsara literally means, you know, the cycle of birth and death, going in and around all of this kind of stuff. Um, the elimination of these uh, afflictive states within this very lifetime brings peace and equanimity in the face of life's trials and tribulations and true happiness. So the bliss of nirvana is not the fleeting happiness of finding a good parking spot, winning the lottery, job satisfaction, or a happy relationship with a loving partner. These are what Buddhists would call mundane happiness. Buddhist happiness is a lasting, enduring kind of equanimity that is not dependent on external circumstances. It's a transcendent state of peace and happiness that gets no traction whatsoever because of actual circumstances. No matter what happens to you, your peace and happiness is secure. All right? No matter what doesn't happen to you, <laughs> uh, your peace and happiness remains secure. There's no traction uh, because of actual circumstances. Um, and this gives us an approach <coughs> to the Buddhist definition of happiness, one that concerns what is eliminated, all negative states or afflictions, and one, con one that concerns what is acquired or perhaps discovered to always have been the case, true and lasting happiness. Both are perfected states. Um, afflictions are entirely and forever eliminated. This is not a sort of momentary kind of thing where they might come back. And our happiness is also a perfect happiness, free of any kind of contamin ca contamination or degeneration. So my first point is that this doesn't at all sound like the happiness of the happiness industry. Uh, it is much, much more. Uh, it is a radical well-being. So when you're reading a Buddhist book, you know, this, the, these dialogue books, um, be mindful, um, pun intended, of qualifiers such as ultimate happiness, true happiness, lasting happiness, non-contingent happiness, authentic happiness, unconditional happiness, and the like, because they signal a rather more radical understanding of happiness, and you should be aware of what you're buying into if you buy into those kinds of ultimate kinds of statements. Similarly, be careful of the Buddhist side bracketing those terms, not using those kinds of terms. Uh, why? Because they know full well that if these sorts of ultimate and permanent qualifiers are added to the happiness, happier agenda, scientists will balk at the human potential for such a state as well as to the metaphysical presuppositions that underlie such claims. So I'd like to put off the metaphysical claims for just a bit and begin with the more practical, that is the psychological descriptions of our afflictions and their elimination. Uh, which I think is one of a, actually one of the most fruitful areas of, uh, of this dialogue, although I think it's still fraught with difficulty. And it's especially fraught with difficulty because I know nothing about what I'm going to talk about for about the next 10 or 15 minutes, okay? I'm going to use terms like uh, occipital and parietal, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, the classic formulation of awakening in the Buddhist tradition is the total elimination of all suffering through the complete destruction of greed, 
hatred and ignorance, known in the Buddhist tradition as the three poisons. Um, but is it really possible? You know, is it really possible for human beings to completely and permanent, permanently eliminate all negative states, all emotional turbulence, all destructive emotions um, as they have been, come, have they, that, that's, we, we, the Buddhist word is klesha, and through with the work of Dan Goleman, the term destructive emotion has come to be very widely used for this. Um, it's kind of hackneyed and it doesn't work very well, and when you get into it, it points up all of the places where the dialogue is, is missing, but that's what it's come, come to be called. A lot of psychologists and clinical thera therapists <laughs> <coughs> there we go. Um, would, uh, would deny the possibility or even the desirability of such a state. One um, uh, therapist, Jerry Rubin, wrote, for example, from <coughs> the psychoanal psychoanalytic perspective, a static, conflict-free sphere, a psychological safe house beyond the vicissitudes of conflict and conditioning where mind is immune to various aspects of affective life, such as self-interest, egocentricity, fear, lust, greed, and suffering is quixotic. Since conflict and suffering seem to be inevitable aspects of human life, the ideal of enlightenment may be asymptotic, that is, an unreachable goal. And if there's anything that seems to be true of our life, it is that things are, in fact, impermanent, changing, and transitory. And interestingly, that's also the Buddhist description <laughs> of reality, right? Um, so. Um, to think that this would be different for some kind of imagined state of Buddhist happiness seems to me to be rather silly and, in fact, would make you a real Buddhist heretic. In fact, we might be closer to the case to say that if our happy moments were not coming and going, we would not, in fact, be able to experience them as happy. Right? This is a pretty common, I'm not a philosopher, but it's pretty common, right? If everything is beautiful, then, uh, duh, well, then nothing's beautiful, right? You know? So, um, so there's, some, there's some problems there. Um, but the most obvious problem uh, with completely eliminating all negative states is that we would have to bypass all aspects of the contingent and, and uh, conditioned wiring and firing of our brains. Because, according to both Buddhist thinkers and most modern psychology, that is the source of negativity. Take, for example, take for example the fear generated by the famous snake. Oh no, it's a rope. Right? <laughs> um, as we enter the forest path late at night, uh, after a long meditation session in northeast Burma, uh, somewhere, and in spite of being in a state of deep calm because of our, our, our practiced meditation, we have a bit of a sense of vigilance that's still going on. It's naturally heightened, perhaps because of memories of other snakes or because other meditators have told us that it's not such a safe forest and to be careful. Um, and so not necessarily tense or frightened because we are good meditators, right? Um, but nonetheless, we're, uh, we're, we're paying attention. Um, there are groups of brain regions that function together uh, when the brain is in a restful or a non-task focused yet tonically active state. This is where Phil's really yelling at me because I, I, he, I have apparently the default mode network rather completely backwards, but that's all right. We'll talk about this one later. Um, so there you go. You're going through the forest and you're, you know, you're, you're vigilant. You're, you're, you're awake. You know, you're, you're looking at things. You're sitting in your chair, your restful chair at home. That, that doesn't mean that your mind is vacant from paying attention to anything that goes around. Maybe the phone rings. Maybe you hear a noise over in the kitchen and you wonder if the cat got fed today. Um, but you're still in a relaxed state of mind. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, you start to see something that looks like the famous snakes and ropes. Oh no, snakes and ropes. Oh no. Um, and all kinds of things get triggered, right? Um, again, I can't even pronounce these words. Um, but, you know, things like um, uh, adrenaline, of course, uh, norepinephrine, uh, uh, cortisol gets fired up, um, all kinds of neurochemical responses that are associated with stress. And is it neurobiologically impossible 
to eliminate this mildly anxious state of vigilance? Would you want to? Still, it's a nice night for the walk. And after all, you are a calm and relaxed meditator. So you continue on your walk, and there it is, coiled on the forest path. Beginning with everything involved in the visual process, information is fast-tracked to the amygdala, um, and all kinds of other things take over. And um, in the end, there you are with the fight or flight response. Um, hopefully, you know, the slightly more evolved uh, parts of your brain, um, not the uh, reptilian brain, um, are going to kick in. Uh, Memories, uh, what vi visual memories will come into play. You'll, you'll notice that the other people walking down the path are not freaking out. Um, and you'll remember that actually they told you that there aren't any snakes in this part of, part of the forest. And I mean, that's a slower, that's a slower path. That's a slower um, uh, part of your brain. But hopefully you're able to calm down and continue on with your walk as your neurophysiological system calms down. Um, is it impossible to have the mistaken experience of the snake or the correct experience of the rope without the eye, uh, the occipital lobe, the hippocampus, the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, the parietal lobe, the anterior singular cortex, to mention a whole bunch of things that I don't know anything about, and the neurochemicals that they release. And so the same biology that delivers the experience of the snake rope will necessarily generate the neuronal processes that result in some stimulation of the flight or fright, f fight or flight response. Needless to say, this is a good thing. <laughs> it is appropriate to run away from some things. And it is precisely our more primitive responses and motivations, instincts or emotional responses, if you like, that get us running more quickly. All of those self-preservation kinds of things. Um, while it appears certain that these responses can be modulated and, and attenuated, it cannot and should not, in my opinion, be eliminated. Uh, while we should not be driving in the red zone of ro road rage at all times, freaking out about everything that's going on, we still need to be attentive drivers. By definition, Buddhas have no fear. It's a very important part of the definition of a Buddha. Um, it's why you, a Buddha is, is a refuge. Um, and in fact, it's, the Buddha is said to have remained calm in the face of an enraged elephant charge. Perhaps this is true, but I hope the rest of you move. <laughs> okay? Um, oh, and by the way, I love my snake. <laughs> I was actually scared out of my mind about this. Um, this was in Vietnam on an alumni tour. Um, and at one stage of the game, they led us down to this place, and they had this really big snake. And, of course, they offered to drape it on me, the faculty host kind of guy. Um, and, yeah, I was trying to kiss him. What can I say? Um, <coughs> but all kinds of questions remain, you know, if, about whether it's actually possible to completely eliminate all afflicted emotions and attain a happiness entirely independent of all circumstances and of all conditions. Um, in the Buddhist world, um, we, they ask about whether it's possible to eliminate the link between sense experience, the contact of the sense organ and the sense object, um, and the pleasant or unpleasant feeling, the hedonic tone that comes from this, uh, and the craving that necessarily follows it. And this is a little bit controversial, and I don't agree with several of my buddies out there in the audience, um, but they talk about that, whether or not it's possible to eliminate these sensory experiences and the kinds of things that go on in your psychology uh, <coughs> as a result. Um, dopamine. How about dopamine? <laughs> How about dopamine? <laughs> um, dopamine is... Um, Feeling, uh, associated with pleasant and unpleasant feeling, and together with other neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, uh, they're key to our constant search for what is pleasant and to our aversion to what is an unpleasant. Can these neurochemicals ever be entirely absent from the practitioner? Would anybody want to achieve such a state? For example, med meditation increases our levels of serotonin, calmness and well-being, and it's also linked to, uh, to increased dopamine. 
As the neural imprint of the meditation experience increases, we seek that experience again. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you, meditation for the dopamine high. Um, very much like addicts, you know, in a way. Um, and I don't know about you, but I know some pretty serious meditation addicts, right? Um, falling levels of dopamine create an unpleasant feeling tone and tense, uh, and therefore desires to jack it back up again through what? More meditation? Okay. Uh, even when meditating, if, you're con if your concentration isn't stimulating, this is a very interesting thing that I just read, if your concentration isn't stimulating enough, and so for those of you that think that meditation is emptying your brain and doing nothing, um, if your meditation isn't stimulating enough, and many of you other, other, meditation inside the mind is infinitely interesting. Nano by split nanosecond, you can have a lot of fun in there. So if it's not, though, because it takes a while to get there maybe, um, if it's not so good, then um, uh, you get bored and you chase more exciting, more dopamine producing thoughts. Uh, daydreams, you know, you can all have your own daydreams. Um, and although we can certainly, I think, train ourselves to make better use of the executive reasoning at our disposal, <coughs> I don't think we can entirely eliminate the neurophysiological aspects of our human experience. The brain has to be involved in anything that could possibly be called a human experience. As Phil put it one time when I asked him uh, this question, he wrote back in an email, quote, a simple way to think about the brain as it relates to behavior is that it consists of two systems, an approach system and an avoidance system. These systems are often represented as left and right uh, prefrontal cortex, but they are systems and hence extend to the more primitive parts of the brain <coughs> which largely monitor the homeostasis of the body, the process that maintains the stability of the human body's internal environment in response to changes in external conditions. Hence, when the body signals hunger, the approach system looks for food, while the avoidance system tries to assure that you don't get hurt finding it or eating it. The simple metaphor can be applied to most systems in the body that are monitored, hunger, thirst, warmth, sex, and the rest. That is, things that we desire, things that we crave, things that we try to avoid. Note that the system is so efficient that much of this goes on automatically, and we don't have to devote much conscious processing to it. However, the craving and aversion still exist and will be triggered whenever one of the homeostatic monitors tells the brain that something's out of whack. Without craving and aversion, we would no longer engage in be behaviors to restore homeostasis, and we would die. Uh, to put it in more classical Buddhist terms that I am familiar with, um, consciousness <coughs> cannot originate unconstructed or pure consciousness because it, it is itself constructed. Right? To put it in terms of intentional actions, uh, which is the Buddhist word, that we uh, that's karma. Right? To put it in terms of intentional actions, uh, all karma is by definition tainted. That is, the, prior of the product of prior action tainted by desire, aversion, and ignorance. And therefore, can only lead to more of the same. This is a very, like, one of those angels on the head of a pin kind of argument in, in pretty heavy-duty Buddhist philosophy. Um, but the basic notion is that my brain cannot, by definition, give rise to the purity of a Buddha's brain. So the question of where that might come from gets kind of, kind of fun and intriguing, right? <laughs> um, but as Shundu Suzuki put it, rather famously, if you are trying to attain enlightenment, you are being driven by karma and creating more karma. You are wasting your time on your cushion. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I want awakening. That's a desire. That's a tainted karmic formation in the Buddhist world, which, as I said, leads to all kinds of amazing uh, things. But um, just so you know, here's what he looks like when he's not meditating on his cushion because he is a Zen master after all. Um, 
So is our motivation to practice free of dopamine reward? Or are, uh, if not, are we, you know, if, if all of my desire to practice is by definition driven by or involved with a dopamine reward um, syndrome, uh, am I a neurobiological etantica? You know, I'm neurobiologically precluded from achieving a state of uh, purity. Uh, there's lots of other stuff we could talk about too. Um, <coughs> our need for uh, distinction, the parietal lobe, and you know the things that know that I'm not you and that keep me from mm, trying to inhabit you. I keep pointing to him because George is a dear old friend um, and has long been involved in lots of these conversations. Um, you know, could I, could, could I, would I want to experience life without the functioning of that sense of Okay, in Buddhist terms, duality. You know, non-duality gets a whole lot of play out there in the world. What would it really feel like to experience non-duality? I mean, am I going to become you, the tree, the podium? I mean, I have no understanding of how that works. I'm just a simple boy from Milwaukee, and so the idea of me being different from a tree, I like. <laughs> Um, the, main diff the main affliction to be uprooted is um, variously characterized as ignorance or delusion or misknowing. And that's an even more intractable problem. And I'm going to start skipping through this stuff pretty quickly because it's a mountain to go. Um, and I'm simply going to say that uh, my experience uh, from reading the literature uh, that I've been privy to, and that's very popular these days, is that um, it is impossible uh, to experience a world that is, uh, or, our, or our experience of the world is by definition and necessarily flawed. We don't see it correctly. We don't experience it correctly. Um, you know, you probably all know this story, right? Everybody knows this one, right? Um, if you, if you're told to count how many passes the basketball players make, you don't see the gorillas behind them, right? <laughs> um, they did the same thing with Tibetan monks, very experienced practitioners, and the, and the response was the same. You know, they're, they're no better at it than anybody else. Um, you know, we've got physical holes in the retina of our eye, right? I mean, I don't see the world uh, properly. The brain fills in with memory, input, and other kinds of perceptual Im uh, information, creating an illusion. Of, um, of whole sight. And, and it's especially true of color perception. Only something like 10% of the, um, uh, I don't know what you call them, nodes, uh, that, um, that are delivered to us are capable of seeing color. The rest of it is coming to us in black and white, and we fill it in. And we fill it in to, to, to both create, a, a, it, to create a, a unified chromatic field of vision. I look out there and I see colors everywhere, right? And, and that's, that's coming from my brain. It's not coming from what's out there. I'm not physically capable of that. And, you know, I've got those holes in the middle of my eyeball too. What am I going to do about those, right? Um, these processes are neither um, conceptually, uh, cognitively accessible, nor are they going to change in normal experience. And I, I think probably uh, they, they shouldn't. So my conclusion from all of this um, is that if you have, uh, if you have the meat, <laughs> you will have the equipment that goes with it. Neurons, synapses, dopamine, endorphins, and hosts of other physical and neurobiological products and processes. And so you're also going to have the perceptual, aperceptual, cognitive biases that go along with those products and those processes. The hard wiring is dodgy. Um, and the neurological holes um, and, uh, in our vision, there's no hearing or seeing that is not processed and ditto for consciousness. Perception is never immediate and never pure. But that is what the perception of a Buddha is, a person who has pure, veridical, immediately presented experience of things in themselves. Um, but interestingly, um, it's not only the modern scientist 
uh, who might have some issues with the notion of a complete elimination of all of these processes. Um, Buddhists, too, um, had a lot of problems with this. Um, they found it rather fantastic. And it, they very quickly took a couple of different tracks uh, with regard to such a being, meaning a, a, a Buddha being. On the one hand, early Buddhist traditions made a distinction between Buddhas and his followers, declaring that Buddhas were beings of an entirely different uh, order altogether. Indeed, so different that another Buddha cannot appear in the same Buddha world together with another Buddha. There can't be more than one Buddha in a world at a time. And those worlds are defined as hundreds of billions of years long. Right? Um, so the Buddhas, Buddhists themselves very immediately came to see that there were problems with their, um, their descriptions. Um, they also, uh, uh, yeah, so there were, there were lots of spiritually evolved beings, lots of followers who were said to have e achieved very evolved states. Um, but another track that they took was to attribute to, their, to these followers, to the non-Buddha followers, meaning all of the followers, um, various kinds of lingering impurities uh, for you Buddhists out there in the world, little nighttime dopamine surges, shall we call them. <coughs> uh, but most typically, what the Buddhists did uh, and again, this, it's a complicated story involving lots of different places and times. Uh, they invoked what uh, my buddy Paul Griffiths called the intuition to maximal greatness. And they blew the notion of Buddha so far out of proportion as to no longer be a human being at all, but rather an inherently luminous existence that encompasses the entirety of the cosmos, yet partook of none of it an entirely transcendent ultimate being. Um, let me just look very quickly at that version of a Buddha because uh, uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that, you know, if, uh, it, needless to say, if the scientific community has trouble with the notion of a consciousness that is purified of every last vestige of attraction, aversion, and somehow privy to odd states of primordial self-presenting and veridical experience, they really have problems with the pure Buddha mind that is brought in to rescue the possibility of awakening from our neurobiologically contingent human existence. Um, and the second reason I want to bring this in is because this idea is hugely popular these days in every stretch of the world. Uh, it's what Carol was referencing when, when she talked about the book that I had written a long time ago called Pruning the Bodhi Tree. It, it, is, it is responsible for the, the uh, dissolution of the Massachusetts Association of Tibetans, Tibetan people, um, because the Dalai Lama affirms this tenant, which he should not as a good Galupa, or in my opinion, as a good Buddhist. Um, and this is the idea of a pure mind, um, original goodness, original enlightenment, or Buddha nature that underlies our turbulent, suffering mind. Um, and it's amazingly contemporary, uh, amazingly pervasive in contemporary Buddhist writings on happiness and psychology. Jack Kornfield, a good Theravada Buddhist who should also have no truck with this notion, um, writes, a key principle, do I have that up there? Yeah, okay. Um, I, what do I have up there? Well, I have a slightly different thing. Uh, the true and essential nature of the mind is called Buddha nature. Pure, pure and luminous and unrelated to the, to the contaminated neuronal mind. Um, and I'm getting a little lost. My slide technology is not so very good. The Dalai Lama, who I just mentioned, in his sect of Buddhism, his denomination of Galukpa Buddhism, they also affirm that the teaching of Buddha nature is not good Buddhism. <laughs> it's what's called Buddhism in need of interpretation. In other words, it's not a high truth, right? Um, and he writes about it fairly, uh, fairly insistently. Um, uh, there is no reason to believe that the very subtlest state called innate mind, uh, Buddha nature, uh, Tathagatagarbha, the very essential nature of awareness itself, which is its luminous nature, would have neural correlates because it is not physical 
not contingent upon the brain. Um, now, the notion of an inherently pure mind, I think, serves as a strong motivating factor for a lot of folks, offering the hope that uh, who we really are is not our screwed up selves that we experience all the time with all of our sufferings and all of our delusions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we too can experience the full perfection of a Buddha if we can but eliminate the chance defilements that bedevil us. I got to Kaklesha. Unfortunately, the idea of a primordial luminescent mind is another one of those things that's not going to be uh, accepted much by uh, a cognitive scientist. Um, one person sums it up pretty well, and I mean, I realize that there are lots of different cognitive scientists and other sorts of scientists out there, and a lot of them oddly believe in this concept too. Um, but one guy sums it up saying, uh, quote, uh, Christoph Koch is his name, there must be an explicit correspondence between any mental event and its neuronal correlates. Another way of stating this is that any change in a subjective experiential state must be associ associated with a change in a neuronal state. Um, other authors uh, who do, some, there's some Buddhist authors, the guys uh, Hansen and um, Mendius wrote a, a very, I, I kind of like, uh, gets a little simple towards the end, but uh, they wrote a book called Buddha's Brain, sort of bringing some of these ideas together, and they affirm the notion of a pure and luminescent mind mind, yes, not brain. <laughs> um, even they say the brain, the meat, right, is the necessary and proximally sufficient condition for the mind. Right? That's all you need is the brain to have the mind. Um, so, you know, out of politeness and, um, you know, a, a lot of this conversation gets bracketed. People are not going to have the uh, dialogue and talk about ultimate luminescent, pure states of mind that exist primordially and without any connection, right? Non-contingent, no connection to, uh, to, to the brain, right? Most people aren't going to have that. And um, so, you know, I mean, again, I hate to keep picking on the Dalai Lama, but I'm going to have to say, this is his comment on the, on the fact of the existence of this. He can't say it exists. He's had no experience of it, nor has he ever met anybody who has any experience of it. Interesting. Um, <coughs> with the Dalai Lama, I also find that this sort of nirvana uh, is empirically undemonstrated. Um, he's also said um, this state of realization is said to be utterly devoid of negative emotions and consequently of suffering. Is such a realization possible? In answer to this, one has to rely on the testimonies of Buddhas and other enlightened beings. Again, the Dalai Lama has never met anybody that, I, I, I've been collecting this, I ask everybody that I meet, every Buddhist, um, Andy gets nailed on this one all the time, Mu Sung, lots of the rest of you in the audience. Um, you know, I, you know I've, I've asked the Dalai Lama, you know, Bob Thurman, all these people, have you ever met a Buddha? And not a single one. I mean, there's some cutesy answers that you can give. Yes, everybody's a Buddha, or my favorite one was from Glenn Mullen who said, well, yes, Jamie, but of course it takes a Buddha to recognize a Buddha. <laughs> which, is a very, which is a very good Buddhist answer, dodgy in its own way, but nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, where is Buddha? Um, you know, where, 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 where do we find this? Um, uh, the Buddha can't find it. And then when you do a look out there empirically, what do you find? I mean, you know, we can go around all the Zen centers we want, and we find a lot of pretty scandalous behavior. There's a lot of dodgy monks out there, and you can find this in Sri Lanka. I mean, how about Burma? How about what's going on over in Burma these days with those? I mean, that's a very Buddhist, a very devout, and I'm going to say ethically Buddhist country. And what are they doing? And they're hooked up with our buddies in, in Sri Lanka, you know? And, and, it's, 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 and, and the sex scandals in Zen centers in America. You know, when you look out there empirically, Nobody's ever met one, and what you see is a little bit less than, um, than perfection. So, <coughs> are there other things that we might get into? Mm, no, we should stop, right? 
Uh, okay, then I'll just say two things real quickly. We'll just slip right through some slides here, and I'll just talk off the cuff. Um, one of the interesting things that is coming from the uh, dialogue between the psychologists and, uh, and the Buddhists, I think, is uh, a redefinition of the notion of emotions and an elimination of the idea that there's some kind of um, mind-heart separation. You know, some kind of duality where emotions exist somewhere uh, differently. This has always been the Buddhist understanding of afflictions. Our afflictions have always been understood to be cognitive. Anger is cognitively rooted, right? Same thing with all the other things that, that muck us up. And, um, and I think that's kind of interesting um, because another thing that's coming out of this uh, you know, and I, I realize that I'm doing a little bit of neurophrenology here. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we've had a long number of decades of the run of right brain, left brain discussion, right? And, um, you know, it's like, which, which, which do you want to be? You know, I mean, I, I want to be the curvy female one, you know, the, the, the left mode has been getting all this press, right? The, 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 the processing center of, you know, the bicameral mind notion. And I think it is a little bit of neurophrenology these days. Um, but it is still widely popular out there in the world. You know, the, you, you know, your right brain, your artistic, your left brain, you talk too much. <laughs> and you like logic and you like math and you do computer science or something, right? Um, and, you know, this, this, you know, Roger Sperry's, uh, you know, very famous uh, quote, and he's a Nobel laureate, uh, he got it going in a big way. And it kind of led to a gold standard for the intuitive, intuitive nonverbal uh, mind and uh, sort of a demonization. I mean, look at this. You know, here, 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 here we've got the right side, you know, I'm a hippie in the park and here, here I'm in my cubicle, right? You know, and in this one is even more, more explicit, you know. Um, so it, it really did have a kind of interesting effect on things. But what, what we're finding out now, uh, Richie Science, who, uh, Richie Science, <laughs> um, Richie Davidson uh, from uh, Wisconsin, who's been out here more than once, is a very big player in all of this kind of stuff in the Mind and Life Institute, um, has said, uh, has been showing um, that when brain activity in the left prefrontal cortex is, is high, people are happier. So here's a quote from him. When activity in the left prefrontal cortex is markedly and chronically higher than in the right, people report feeling alert, energized, enthusiastic, and joyous, enjoying life more, and having a greater sense of well-being. Put simply, they tend to be happier. When there is greater activity in the right prefrontal cortex, people report feeling negative emotions, including worry, anxiety, and sadness. They express discontent with life and rarely feel elation or joy. If the asymmetry is so extreme, uh, that activity in the right prefrontal cortex swamps that in the left, the person runs a high risk of falling into clinical depression. And so what's interesting to me about this is that what's coming out of this is, is an old, uh, it, it, it's kind of a return. It's, it, I mean, it's much more complicated. It's not a, simply, a simple return, but it's a little bit of a return to a kind of moving back to control your emotions with your mind. Right? The left prefrontal cortex is the seat of executive functioning, right? where you, you think about how your actions are going to play out down the line, where you think about how your interactions with other people are going to play out. It's the place where you are able to make those kinds of uh, executive uh, decisions. And so what I find from both sides, and this has clearly been the Buddhist side for a long, long time. The Buddhists have never, ever said, Oh, you're angry. Let it all out, man. You know, give rise to your primal scream. You know, never been, no, it's, it's always been a control thing, you know. Or it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's been pretty close to that. So I find it very interesting. This is, I think, again, one of the very fruitful areas uh, of this kind of discussion is that they're coming back to the idea that, you know, you can avoid emotional hijack uh, the more you have a kind of control uh, of your brain. So. Um, I'm just going to finish very quickly then. There's all kinds of other fun stuff to talk about rebirth and uh, am I really suffering? I'm not. 
Um, even though the Buddhists want to tell me that I am, I don't believe them. Um, and actually, most studies in the world also show that most people are actually not suffering most of the time. You know, even you look at the lowest states in the United States, um, which tend to be Alabama and Mississippi down there and those kinds of places, lots of poverty, lots of racism. Um, and even down there, they tend to score around 64 to 66 percent of people reporting that most of the time they feel contented and well-being. Right? Now, the problem with these things is they're, they're what's called subjective well-being reports. I mean, you know, it's like I ask you, how, how do you feel? And you tell me you feel fine. And there's the Pollyanna effect. There's all kinds of reasons people lie about this stuff. But these, these, these um, conclusions go across gender, age lines, economic lines, across country after country. Um, and it's, it's very widely reported. Um, and that's interesting. So to my mind, <coughs> while I think that it's certainly a reasonable thing to uphold an ideal of psychological perfection and to take inspiration from the nobling idea tales of our superheroes, our Buddhas, at some point it's equally reasonable to ask the question of whether this ideal is an actual possibility or a utopian uh, fantasy, utopos literally no action, no, no, no real place. Right? Um, in fact, you know, it, it's kind of a sort of unrealistic, unrealistic optimism. Um, on the other hand, to my mind, when you deny uh, transcendent perfection, which in my opinion is what was going on in the original Buddhist storyline in terms of the religious and philosophical milieu in which he worked, um, denying uh, that kind of transcendent perfection of Atman Brahman, it's known as, denying an impossible or transcendent ultimate reality does affirm humanity in that we are now free to be concerned with our everyday real sufferings of real human beings and leave the superheroes on the shelf for their inspirational value. Um, incidentally, it also means that as my graduate advisor foretold long time ago, that um, as I age, as with all Buddhists, according to him, I've become a Pure Land Buddhist. Um, the Pure Land uh, tradition is a tradition which affirms that all living beings are inescapably ichantika. Awakening is precluded. I mean, there's a whole lot of other storylines there, but that's, that's the basic one, right? And um, uh, it's also, interestingly, uh, the um, largest dominant form of Buddhism in most of East Asia. And it was also the lineage of Tai Tetsu Unno and his family for many, many generations. He was, you know, he, that, that was his family uh, tradition. So to my mind, that uh, when, you know, you get down to what, okay, we are going to just go all the way to the end here. Doink, 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 how can you skip on me? <laughs> and, and, and my whole trash of Zen meditation and why you would want to be that. I mean, who wants to be a guy that has no legs? Um, and they Zen people did start quite a hell of a lot of wars, right? And my point about all of this is, I mean, when flow, I'm sure that Mike Tyson was in a state of flow, uh, as with um, the, was he a Brazilian guy that started biting the soccer players, right, more recently? Um, um, in the Buddhist path, when you kind of dump some of these more transcendent ideas and you get away from the notion of simply uh, concentration or meditation, there's another part of the project. And the other part of the project is not much talked about in the, our Buddhist world, in our psychological, uh, uh, in, in the dialogues that are going on today. Everybody's doing MBSR, right? Everybody's meditating their butts off. The only people that don't meditate are Buddhists that live in Asia, right? <laughs> All Americans meditate quite a lot. Um, and this, um, this, this path includes these other aspects, right? One is knowing. And it's not some kind of mystical knowledge. It's knowing some real stuff. And the other, importantly, includes ethical action, right? Ethical action. And, you know, nowadays it seems like 
our point is that it's not about ethical actions. It's about feeling good, not being good. Right? Um, that's, that's what the happiness craze feels like to me uh, when I read it. And especially because, as I say, when, when I read it, I find it rather bereft of these other aspects of, um, of the Buddhist tradition. So to my mind, where the action is, is in some of these other areas, some of these other kinds of, uh, of places. Um, uh, dualistic it might be to emphasize good and evil and right and wrong and knowing some things and giving up on other things. Um, but I think that good science is showing very clearly that an ethical life is extremely conducive to well-being. And as my, uh, my colleague Jay Garfield put it, not rocket science perhaps, but potentially more valuable to humankind than much that is. Thank you. And that's what didn't get read. <laughs> well then. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'll take questions. Of course I'll take questions. <laughs> so about the neuronal mind, uh, I'm just curious, I've, I've done a lot of reading in Buddhist studies, as you know, and there must be something I've missed because um, there is no behavior without a biological substance. There's no thought, there's no anything. So when they say beyond the neuronal mind, are they dualists? Are they? Are they dualists? Do, I mean, do they believe in something like a soul? I mean, I know they wouldn't use that word, but what do they mean when they say that this is not about the neuronal There is no, I'll say it again, there is no <laughs> thought, there is no behavior without a biological substrate. That doesn't mean biology is primary in any way. It just what gives rise to thought? Um, I would say a couple of things, of course. <laughs> One is that that topic, the Buddha nature, the luminescent pure mind, is what I'm talking about that gets bracketed in the conversation a lot. It doesn't come up for those kinds of reasons. People won't have much truck with it, right? It doesn't make sense to the community of interlocutors, right? Um, and so that's something that you know about when you read more strictly Buddhist kinds of things where they're kind of talking amongst themselves. And <clears throat> I would actually say that um, Buddhists are, I, I would say they're, they're one step beyond dualists because there's a very clear mind-body dualism in the sense that consciousness, um, we're not talking about awakened consciousness now, that luminescent stuff. We're just talking about the, the con what, what transmigrates from one birth to another birth is consciousness. And it's not an awakened consciousness. It's just the same kind of consciousness that I have every day, you know, like me going to sleep at night and waking up with another stream of consciousness in a slightly different body. Um, but, it is, but it is consciousness, and it's not dependent on the brain. So in that sense, they're pretty classically dualist, right? But then you throw in the Buddha nature mind, and that mind is a mind which um, is unconstructed, pure, one. It's Svasam Vedna. It's a hard topic to translate. Um, we have people out here who can do it better than me. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a pure mind. It's a Buddha mind. And I'm going to say that in the end, for all intents and purposes, it corresponds to a platonic sense or a later developed Christian sense of soul. Or to put it back in its Buddhist, South Asian, East Asian roots, it corresponds to the self that the Buddha originally denied. Because that consciousness, that Buddha nature, right, also is, is un, it's not contingent upon the consciousness that transmigrates. 
you have consciousness in your body while you're alive in this state, and then when this dies, the consciousness will transmigrate to another body. But the Buddha nature mind, the luminescent true mind, is of another sort altogether. And it gets, it gets really wacky when you get into it because Buddhists have trouble. They have trouble they have trouble bringing together the sense of maximal greatness, which pushes them to posit that the Buddha is this perfect one thing that doesn't do anything. I mean, can have no parts. Buddhas can have no thoughts, okay? No emotions, no none of that stuff in, in the developed Buddhology. Um, yet at the same time, Buddhists are committed to maximally compassionate involvement in the world. And they've spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to bring these two positions together. Because one, uh, and the, the common answer, I mean, I know this answer more from East Asia, but a little bit from Tibet. Um, the most common answer is that um, the Buddha does not exist. We just make him up. It's, the, yeah, a lot, of, a lot is spilled on it, and, and, it's, and it's very problematic in the Buddhist tradition because, as I said, they have these, these two kind of competing impulses to maximal greatness, one in the sense of, of sort of ontology, maybe also cognition, and the other in sense of uh, moral behavior in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but like I said, that's why I, that's why I said... Be careful when you don't hear the words ultimate happiness, true happiness, perfect happiness, it's because those all depend on that mind of pure Buddha nature. Okay. Hello. Hello. No, no, I, I'm not laughing. I mean, I, yes, I, I've, I've read that kind of literature. And but it, was, it was fascinating because it was a guy who they came up with all these like, uh, psychological reasons why he kept saying, my house is not my house, my parents are not my parents, like all these reasons why this might be wrong with him. And what it was was the link between his visual cortex and his emotional cortex had been damaged. And so it felt wrong to him, all his surroundings. Uh huh. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Where do you see this happiness craze going? <laughs> um, I don't see it dying down anytime soon. Um, I mean, it seems to be burgeoning in, in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, again, I, I, I warned you that I was likely to be, you know, uh, mistaken. I have no problems or issues whatsoever with people wanting to be happier and with cultivating practices that will do it, um, that, will, that will help them with that. And I definitely think that um, the technologies, you, you notice I, I keep referring them to, uh, to the, as technologies of awareness, right? There's many contemplative technologies. There's many, pra I mean, we don't pray. Buddhists in the West don't pray. Buddhists in Asia pray a lot. They chant a lot. And, you know, it's maybe a little hard for us to sort of get into it, <laughs> depending on what your background is, your religious background is. But, um, you know, visualization exercises, there's just, there's just a whole lot of things that, not, not just the Buddhist tradition, but other, other contemplative, uh, other religious, other practices, including, including the sciences, can, br can bring to stuff. And I think that's all a, a wonderful thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not willing to commit myself to endless rounds of rebirth 
in self-help seminars, <laughs> book buying, and the like. At the same time, I like all, I, I, well, I don't know, maybe not all of it, but um, you know, I like, I like these practices and, and enjoy them thoroughly. So, I, I mean, I hope more people do more things, but I don't know if the average person needs to spend a couple thousand dollars a year and an hour a day uh, working on it. But that's, you know, that's just me. <laughs> Take a nap. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. For you, what would it take? Like, how would you know if you met one? Or what would give it away? Okay, so I, I, obviously, the first step in trying to answer that question with anybody is to define what, a Buddha, what Buddha is. So, in this talk, I gave two answers which I think work pretty well for most of the Buddhist tradition the elimination of uh, greed hatred and ignorance, and the pure Buddha mind. Um, and You know, that, that's, one of, that's one of the most common responses that's given, and it certainly is true in the tradition. It would be considered a fair amount of hubris, right? So usually, spiritually evolved states are ascribed to saints by their communities. Right? But I've never yet heard a community refer to their saint as Buddha. I mean, I have, I'm not an anthropologist or an ethnographer, so I don't know if I've exhausted. Maybe some of my other colleagues have, have met them. I've run into people that are called arhats. Um, bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas comes also kind of close to claim personally. So yeah, so the question is how would I recognize them or how would I know them or how would, how would we even define them, right? I mean, so there are other ways of defining awakening that are much easier, much more common, much more mundane, um, and I wasn't addressing those. I was addressing, because I, I, I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk about this kind of Buddhist approach to things, which I think it's important to talk about. I don't think that these questions should be bracketed. Um, I mean, I think both the Buddhist and the therapist is in the game of wanting to help people. And so I think that the more right we are with our approach to that, the better chances we have of actually you know, having an effect like that. Suzanne? So, Jamie, I am not familiar with the happiness discourse as it's being produced by these <laughs> psychologists you're referring to. But I just want to ask you, is it really the case that they're not engaged with issues of ethics at all when they're talking about trying to cultivate happiness? It, are they never getting outside of the individual to look at that individual in relationship with others? Is there, is there, is there no space in there for conversation about ethics? Um, my, actually, actually, and thank you. One of the other aspects that didn't come up here, it, it's part of the, uh, you know, the Four Noble Truths or whatever it's called here we, we have. Um, and I didn't put up here community, which is, a, which is another important topic that's not much talked about. If you go to IMS and you sit with 100 people for 10 days, you know, you maintain noble science. You, you don't even look at people in the eyes. You don't have communication, you know. So it's a very Western kind of way of doing things. So community is another one, so I'm glad. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to say that in my experience, it's rarely brought up. I mean, when you think about MBSR um, and what goes on there, there is not talk or training of, in my experience, um, ethical issues. And knowledge, a little bit of knowledge is coming in through um, cognitive behavior therapy. That's now getting wedded to MBSR in kind of a big way. So there's a little bit more. 
uh, what is cognitive behavior therapy? Um, the idea that w how you think is an important part of how you feel and behave. So it's a little bit, you know, change your, change your mind kind of things, you know. You learn, un, unlearn maladaptive strategies for happiness. Learn why it's not okay to vent at the guy that just cut you off on the Coolidge Bridge, right? And learn why it's better to practice compassion. Which would lead me to the one place that I do see in this conversation. Um, and I mean, it's come on, we've all seen it come on in the last 20 years, and that's the practice of metta. Uh, or compassion in some other terms. Metta is probably a little more commonly known. Um, but you know, interestingly, uh, you do know, um, metta is actually not part of Buddhist shila. <laughs> metta is part of Buddhist samadhi. And so we're talking about it in terms of uh, ethical behavior towards people. We should wish them happiness. We should wish them uh, alleviation of their sufferings and all these kinds of things. But, you know, it's not typical, simple Buddhist morality. You know, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, right livelihood, all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I, just, I don't see it talked about much. I mean, But metta and karuna, yes. That's, that's come on in gangbusters, I think. In the psychological literature. In the psychological literature. I'm sure there's got to be at least three mind and life books right. on compassion now, right? Richie Davidson wrote one of them. I'm sure there's more of them. And, you know, it's being taught in schools as well. So I, that side I do see coming on. But, again, that's a little bit different. been a long day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I do want to let you know, um, uh, Carol mentioned this, um, last semester we had a long series of uh, uh, speakers that were talking about the origins of mindfulness based uh, mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction because they came out of Burma and I was having the joy of spending Smith's money running around Burma for a while. Um, and so we had a lot of ta speakers talking about that. But this semester we're, doing, we're going further. Buddhist studies is not standing still and, and in many ways. And this um, semester we're having a series called Cyborg Buddha and the New Technologies of Awareness. There's an app for that. And we have three more speakers coming up. Um, uh, Robin Arnaud, who's uh, an audio and game designer. I mean, we're talking, you know, you know gamifying your way. You know, this is, you're, you're interested in game stuff, right? So game, gamifying your awareness, gamifying the development of your metta, your compassion, is, is coming on. And so that's the first one. And his talk is called Video Game as Mandala, Enlightenment as Novelty. And then he's followed by Ariel Garten and Michael Apollo, Contemplative Sensors and the Democratization of Contemplative Practice. <laughs> they, they're, they're, they're making some of these. I don't know if you've noticed these out there. There's, a, there's at least 10 or 15 different products, kind of mini uh, EEG machines that you put on. Um, and there's, again, you can gamify your way uh, with these little uh, miniature kinds of um, things. And then there's a final one. Uh, a little bit later down the line, uh, Andrew Fenton from uh, the University of San Diego, who is going to talk about the, ethical, the ethics of pharma, uh, yeah, pharmaceutical neuroenhancement. <laughs> so people are doing all kinds of stuff out there, and I welcome you to all of these. They're, 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 they're a little different, and they're part of the new technologies of awareness. <laughs>